paleoanthropology community intensely followed the lead-up to the unveiling of the newest member of the human family, Homo naledi, long before the fossils were actually revealed. The first public notice was the mysterious Facebook request from Lee Berger in 2013, taken most seriously as this was posted by the well-known discoverer, with a little help from his nine-year-old son, of Australopithecus sediba a few years before. Now famously, it read in part, we need perhaps three or four individuals with excellent archaeological, paleontological, and excavation skills. The catch is this, the person must be skinny and preferably small. They must not be claustrophobic, they must be fit, they should have some caving experience, climbing experience would be a bonus, they must be willing to work in cramped quarters, have a good attitude, and be a team player. Indeed, they needed all those qualities to explore a cave system so inaccessible, so tiny and remote and utterly dark, in which human relatives, but not human beings like ourselves, had waited patiently for who knows how long for discovery. In 2014, I paid rapt attention when another leader of the team, John Hawkes, distinguished paleoanthropologist from Wisconsin-Madison, was very clear that there were findings in the Rising Star Cave System near the Cradle of Humanity Paleoanthropology site in South Africa that were extremely important, that were among the rarest of the rare, and that they did not yet have accurate dating. And gradually, we have learned more and more about this intriguing hominin. So recently, I set out to do what I did in a previous video about Australopithecus. Where I outlined Australopithecus in general and discussed what we'd like to learn about our ape-like bipedal cousins. What are the questions we'd most like to answer? But we've been considering and studying Australopithecus for almost a hundred years now, ever since Raymond Dart first published his discovery of the Tong Child, the type specimen for the Australopithecus genus, in 1925. Naledi is new to us. There is, of course, an overwhelming array of questions about this new group. New research findings are appearing on a regular basis. If you want a general introduction to Naledi, its amazing discovery, the details of the cave system in which it was found, its skeletal anatomy, and I will talk about some of these things, there are many sources out there for that. Check for links in the description. This is by no means a comprehensive introduction to Naledi. But for me, there's an important take-home message about these amazing members of our Homo genus, and that's what I want to get to. Here's the punchline. The most salient impact of Naledi at this early stage on our perspective on human origins is how much of a disruptor this Homo species is. Naledi forces us to question everything we thought we knew about the Homo genus. And as a result, ultimately, these fossils have the potential to force us to identify our biases and to achieve greater clarity about who we are and where we came from in a way that we couldn't see before this discovery. So that's where I'm heading in this discussion. To orient those with the basic, though oversimplified, phylogeny, I present a carefully constructed visual aid I prepared for a previous video. I'm not even going to focus on the divergence of our early ape-like ancestors, but rather to go immediately here to Australopithecus, a diverse group of bipedal apes, including the famous rock star Australopithecus Lucy, a group that lived roughly two to four million years ago. And somewhere between two and three million years ago, an event occurred, still hidden somewhere in deep time, where some early ancestor of the genus Homo diverged from Australopithecus and Early types emerged, including Homo ergaster, Homo habilis, and the extremely well-traveled Homo erectus, which left Africa 
and occupied large parts of Eurasia, even down into Indonesia. And later came others, including our close relatives, the Neanderthals, the Denisovans, with whom we interbred, preserving them permanently in our biology and in our genome, and finally us, Homo sapiens. In this schema, I don't mention the latest edition, Homo naledi. And even now, I wouldn't know where to place them. I'm going to run through a number of pertinent findings and questions, not in depth, but more in breadth, about Naledi. Many of the questions have the same answer. We don't know yet. Naledi has a very unexpected anatomy. It's a mosaic creature, meaning it has a combination of features, some of which appear more primitive and ape-like, or in other words, appear less modified from its origin, and other features that appear highly derived or modified from an earlier form. For example, its foot is very human-like, as are its ankle and leg bones. Naledi stood about five feet tall, but its pelvis is flared, more like that of Australopithecus. Its wrist and palm are human-like, but its curved fingers appear more adapted for climbing. And this in a region that scientists have determined contained few trees at the time. This is just my own musing, but curved fingers, ape-like shoulder, climbing adaptation, few trees, found in caves where climbing is necessary. Could this have something to do with the retained adaptation for climbing? The answer is the same. We don't know. The rib cage is wide, more like Australopithecus, and its shoulder, too, looks primitive. Perhaps most striking is its skull which in shape is very human-like, slender, with distinct brow ridges, a flat face, similar to ours, and a gracile set of jaws with small teeth, indicating they were not using massive muscles of mastication, nor grinding tough dietary vegetation, like many Australopiths. But the brain size was surprisingly small, only slightly larger or in the range of Australopithecus, or that of Homo habilis or Homo ergaster. The Homo naledi cranial capacity ranges from 465 to 610 cubic centimeters in various individuals, compared to the human cranial capacity of approximately 1400 cubic centimeters. So we have a mysterious mix of characteristics and in particular a brain size that would have been unsurprising in a homo skull two million years in age. How are they related to us? Are they ancestors of us? Did we contribute to their extinction? Did we interbreed with them, as appears to be a hallmark of our species? Whenever two populations come into contact, we see mixing. DNA evidence has not yet been possible. And paleoproteomics which I discuss in more detail here, would be most useful and would give an indication of evolutionary relationships between Naledi and other members of the Homo genus. Did they speak? We don't know, but there are three relevant places to look. The middle ear bones, which are different in humans and apes, the throat anatomy, and especially the position of the hyoid bone, and the speech areas of the brain. Middle ear bones have been found and are being analyzed. And although it may change from week to week, to my knowledge, no hyoid bone has yet been found. But endocasts, models of the brain anatomy, made from careful study of the details of the inside of the skull, are surprising. The small Naledi brain has the overall organization of the homo brain in general. It's human-like in shape, with similarly complex cortical convolutions, gyri and sulci, bilateral asymmetry, and in regard to speech capacity, there is a large Broca's area, one of the key brain areas involved in the production of speech in human beings. Moving away from anatomy toward behavior, how did these people navigate a cave so remote that it would have required squeezing through more than a hundred feet through tiny passages in pitch black. This looks like it would have been impossible without light of some kind. So were they using fire 
and yet there's no evidence of fire or fire pits within the Rising Star Cave system. What about tool use? There are no stone tools found associated with these fossils or in the Rising Star Cave system in general. And yet, stone tools were in use two to three million years ago. And the earliest Acheulean hand axes were in use by 1.76 million years ago. There is a proliferation of stone tool kits in Africa during the Middle Paleolithic. Can we really expect that Homo naledi with its small but complex brain didn't use such tools? And then there's the issue that's probably been the most provocative suggestion from Berger, Hawks, and the Discovery team. The details of which I don't want to get too distracted with here, but it's that the explanation that best fits the data is that Homo naledi fossils were found in the remote Dinaledi chamber because Homo naledi was deliberately disposing of its dead in this manner. There are no marks on the skeletons indicating being attacked or dragged by carnivores. There's no evidence ever of flood within the chamber that might have washed fossils in from elsewhere. Only naledi bones, and not even the usual mix of animal bones ordinarily found in other sites with hominid fossils. Note that the suggestion is not to imply intention or to suggest some ritual or symbolic purpose to this behavior, though we don't know, so it's certainly possible. If this treatment of the dead is true, a complex behavior previously only associated with humans and our close relations, the Neanderthals, was performed by a small-brained Homo ancestor hundreds of thousands of years before our Homo sapiens ancestors were thought to have developed such behavior. Let's definitely flag that. So, to the issue of age and dating, Separate groups of experts analyzed the data before knowing the age of the fossils. Skull specialists looked at the skulls. Teeth teams did dentition. Foot folks studied feet. With its mosaic features, Homo naledi is a little like the story of the blind men and the elephant, where blind men who had never seen an elephant before drew different conclusions. You know, the one who touched the side of an elephant said an elephant is like a wall, and the one who touched the tusk said an elephant is like a dagger, and so on. The skull and shoulder scientists would not have been surprised to find a date of one to two million years for these fossils. And the foot and leg folks might have expected a far more recent dating. It turns out that exhaustive and multiple methods by multiple laboratories, some blinded to what they were testing, some receiving non naledi material to keep things honest, have determined a date that lies between 335,000 and 236,000 years ago. And there's no reason to think that these were the last of the naledi. But the dating of these fossils is well within the dates for the early emergence of early Homo sapiens. So flag that too. The proposed age range for these fossils overlaps with the Middle Paleolithic with its proliferation of stone tool kits, suggesting another new question. Who made the stone tool record in Africa from that time period? One conclusion that seems inevitable is that stone tools from this period found without associated fossils can no longer be assumed to have been made by Homo sapiens. Naledi has upended the narrative we have told about the Homo genus for decades. We thought we understood a basic story about the history of the Homo genus. From early Homo habilis, short in stature, small in brain size with more ape-like arms, through Homo erectus with its human-like body plan, larger body and brain size, to Homo sapiens, we thought we saw a pattern. We thought that over time brain size increased. Adaptation for climbing gave way to adaptation for using the arms and hands for manipulation, for tool making. That we went from less upright in stance to fully upright. All leading to the more recent forms, Homo sapiens, Neanderthal, and the more recently discovered Denisovans. But brain size did not increase uniformly in Homo even though the evidence does point to a common pattern of brain organization. 
that differentiates the various Homo species from their Australopithecus forebears. Climbing adaptation did not go away universally. This narrative needs to be discarded because we now know that there were members of our genus living for millions of years, not in accordance with these trends. Naledi may have been in existence until 10,000 or even a thousand years ago for all we know. Not necessarily expanding geographically, but living unobtrusively, unobserved. We have long since replaced our view of relationships within the Homo genus and probably hominin evolution in general from that simple diagram of relationships to one of the bushy, branching, mixing and remixing that is more characteristic of our kind. The metaphor of the braided stream has proliferated. Various populations intermixing with Homo sapiens, the ultimate remaining species. And with no way of knowing exactly which population contributed exactly what to the ultimate result. But Naledi calls for a more radical rethinking of what Homo means. Homo Naledi as disruptor means we must revive our ideas about Homo as a genus. The cognitive error of inevitability can be persuasive. The status quo today can appear as the necessary outcome. Vertebrates are highly successful on Earth, and yet the esteemed paleontologist and evolutionary biologist Stephen Jay Gould was fond of reminding us that if we ran the experiment of life on Earth again, life forms would be radically different the next time than they wound up on this Earth. With Naledi, we have one more in a long series of lessons in conceptual bias, and the false intuition of inevitability that we hold even as we reject such errors in theory. Go back 200,000 years, or for all we know, 50,000 years, and what do we say about the Homo genus with its coexistence on the planet of Homo sapiens, Neanderthal, Denisovans, Homo floresiensis, and Naledi? If we do that, what Homo is looks different. And why should Naledi be the only undiscovered recent member of our genus? Only a tiny part of Africa has been systematically studied for fossils. I regret in 2019 to have to pull out the hackneyed and much mocked cartoon universally derided for its absurdity. And yet we fool ourselves if we think that such bias does not continue even as we criticize the idea. No, the bias is not exactly that of the cartoon, but whether we like to acknowledge it or not, we've operated with a not entirely dissimilar unintentional bias. Naledi is disruptive of our ideas about the Homo genus in at least two ways. First, it challenges our assumption of the movement from the primitive to the derived, from small-brained to large, of a fully upright posture with a markedly diminished adaptation for climbing. And Naledi is disruptive in a second way. Complex behavior not attributed to Homo sapiens for another 200,000 years challenges the notion that cognitive capacity within the Homo genus is a large brain phenomenon. Brain size may not be as essential or as fundamental either for complex behavior or for defining Homo. Naledi apparently lived for millions of years and we only recently noticed. Who knows what other groups wait in the ground in Africa to be discovered. But with our minds opened by the disruptive vision of the Homo Naledi discovery, we can move forward, putting aside old narratives and following wherever the data may lead us. Be sure to subscribe, hit the notification bell icon, and thanks a lot for watching.